Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. The farm-to-table movement has had a significant impact on Virginia agriculture. This week, we visit with Eric Benfeldt with Virginia Cooperative Extension to see how this trend is having an impact on both farmers and consumers. We also have a story on fresh beef versus frozen beef and how this trend in the cattle industry is developing globally. Those stories and more on this episode of Virginia Farming. I'm Jeff Ishy. Well, in times past, Virginia sheep producers would shear their animals every spring and then sell the valuable wool. But times have changed, as we hear in this special report from Dave Miller with Virginia Farm Bureau. The world market price for wool has been depressed for more than three years, so there's little financial incentive for Virginia producers to pay a crew to shear their sheep. As a result, only about a third of Virginia's 85,000 head of sheep are sheared each year. But after more than 50 years in the sheep business, Alvin Thomas of Buckingham County is still going strong. He currently owns about 40 head of sheep and lambs. Most of the sheep uh, in this area uh, are switching over to hair sheep as opposed to wool sheep. Uh, but the better quality lambs come from the wool sheep. Some of the uh, wool breeds have better body conformation, better muscle structure. Thomas says most of the wool from central Virginia is sent to Ohio to be baled into cubes and sold around the world. As the tradition and market for wool has declined, it's becoming more difficult for producers to afford the necessary gear to shear their own flocks. A shearing equipment collector himself, Thomas says buying all new equipment could cost a beginning shearer close to $5,000. And it takes time and practice to learn this specialized skill. This uh, method of shearing sheep is called the Australian method, where the sheep shearer holds and shears his own sheep. Not assisted by, in some methods, you know, people will shear them and lay them up on a table and tie their feet and so forth, but this is Australian method. I know in the New River Valley, a uh, tremendous amount of switch over to hair sheep simply because they don't have enough people that are interested in shearing sheep. And uh, so, uh, you know, getting sheep shearers to come into a region that has just a small number of sheep, um, there, at one time there was enough sheep in, in uh, Buckingham County to, the wool would probably fill half of a tractor and trailer, and now you can haul all the wool in Buckingham County on the back of a pickup truck. Thomas says the world market price for fine wool has been depressed for three years because sheep farmers in Australia and New Zealand stockpiled their excess wool and created a supply backlog. Since he doesn't get much money for his wool, Thomas now raises sheep as a sideline to his cattle business. And he's found a new market for his lambs with local 4-H and Future Farmers of America students. This is a very economical, a very safe project for 4-H and FFA kids. They can have it for 90 to 100 days and be in and out of the business. It's not a long-term project, but they still learn the responsibility to take care of the animal, breaking them and caring for them, and have that agricultural experience without spending a lot of money. Uh, if you get in the horse project, or if you get into a, a cow project, or a show steer, you can tie up several thousand dollars real quickly and then uh, and not have a way to recapture that money. Uh, but And also, there's always a possibility, a liability of getting hurt. It's pretty hard to get hurt, you know, ha handling a show lamb that weighs 100 pounds. Yeah. Sheep are an economical and viable livestock option for Virginia farmers who have pastures not suitable for cattle. They will graze on just about any type of grass, everything except bull thistle. The cooler climate near the mountains of Virginia is also ideal for sheep production. 
And the market for lamb meat continues to grow, especially in urban areas with large immigrant populations. On the negative side, predators like coyotes can destroy a farmer's flock over time. So there are plenty of challenges for sheep farmers like Thomas. But he's hoping Virginians will see flocks of sheep out in the pasture for many years to come. In Buckingham County, this is Dave Miller. Thank you, Dave, for that report. Virginia farmers are making great progress planting corn this spring. The most recent crop progress report indicates Virginia farmers already have more than 30% of the crop planted, primarily due to near ideal field conditions in mid-April. Soil moisture around the state is described as mostly adequate, so hopefully we'll see good germination rates and nice green fields of young corn within just a few weeks. Overall, Virginia farmers intend to plant about 480,000 acres of corn this spring. Well, we are seeing a growing trend, not just here in Virginia, but around the world with consumers demanding fresh beef that has never been frozen. Bob Severa has this report from the American Angus Association. Growing in popularity across Asia, chilled U.S. beef, rather than frozen, adds value because it's shipped direct from packing plants to foreign markets in containers that are kept near the freezing point. Anytime you freeze something in thought, you're breaking down the cells, you have more cooking loss, less water holding capability. So the fact that it's chill, the, the, the image is of much higher quality beef. So a lot of these programs, not all, but a lot of them are centered around bringing in chill to the Asian market. Some cuts, like short plates, are not popular in the U.S., but they're readily accepted overseas. They even bring premiums as high as $15 per head. One of the cuisines they have are like a thin uh, slice of a marinated short plate on a bed of rice into these uh, bento boxes in Japan. It's a, it's a real specialty item uh, that's targeted towards the convenience stores of Japan. Now, the convenience stores are not all that big, but they're high quality, and there's 55,000 of them in Japan. So if you add up 55,000 of them, it's a huge opportunity. Convenience stores in Asia have high-quality, perishable sections with a freshness focus. In Japan, processors pack items into those quick shopping stores several times every day. For the most part, these uh, bento boxes are being consumed the same day they're packed. Very, very high quality. So once again, it's a big contrast to what we think of as convenience stores here. Breaking into foreign markets takes patience. After 40 years in Japan, the U.S. Meat Export Federation is just getting to a time when it can reach out directly to consumers, which will drive retail demand. To be involved with a consumer, as you know, is very expensive. There's not unlimited funds. But, but the good news is the closer you can get to the consumer, the more payback for the industry, the more margin there is for, uh, for our industry. I'm Bob Cervera. Thank you, Bob, for that report. Well, before we know it, it'll be mosquito season here in Virginia. That means it's time to start thinking about vaccinating your horses against mosquito-borne illnesses, such as West Nile virus and Eastern Equine Encephalitis, or Triple E. Officials with the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, they're encouraging all horse owners to check with their veterinarians for vaccination recommendations. Vaccines are effective for only six to 12 months, so horses should be revaccinated annually. Now, just last year in 2016, Virginia had seven confirmed cases of Triple E in horses. The farm to table movement is having an impact on Virginia agriculture. That's our focus on Ag Insights, coming up next. So today we're in Rockingham County and I'm joined by Eric Benfelt with the Virginia Cooperative Extension. And Eric, today we're gonna to talk about the farm to table movement. Tell me, why do you think the farm to table movement has gotten so popular? Well, I think there's several reasons. One is people want to get to know where their food is coming from. They also want to have some type of a relationship with the farmers who's producing the food. And there's also great interest in both the freshness as well as the taste of local food. And so developing a relationship all along the the sort of value chain is really important, trying to connect producers with consumers. Right. 
Well, you know, we've seen so many more farmers markets spring up over the state um, in Virginia over the past few years. It's been amazing. Is that part of this interest for knowing where your, f your food comes from? I think that's part of it, you know, particularly f uh, farm to consumer, farm to uh, more direct consumer relationships. And uh, often when people think about farm to table, they start with farmers markets and possibly with community supported agricultural operations. But now you're seeing both farm to restaurants, farm to grocery stores, farms to school, farm to university. So it continues to grow. So with this farm to table movement, how do you see that impacting farmers? Are they doing anything differently? Well, there's, I think there's a lot of different things here in, in the Shenandoah Valley. We have farmers that you know, of all different sizes, growing methods, and um, at the same time, we have a growing population. So trying to make those connections and linkages with people and and with restaurants uh, that's really been a, a major driver and then we're fortunate that uh, the population continues to grow and so as farmers try to diversify look at different uh, ways to diversify the revenue streams they look at you know, for some it's working with farmers markets for others it might be working with a produce auction or um, a farm to school program so it, right. it's quite diverse. Well it's interesting because the farmers that I've talked to over the years especially recently they're finding out that if they're going to succeed they have to diversify and I keep thinking that this whole farm to table movement is pushing them really to do that. Mm -hmm. There's a huge demand for I don't know say arugula. Well not that many people are growing that. Hey Maybe I can grow that and make some extra money on my land. Is that what is that what you see happening a lot? Well, I, I, I think the diversification, as you know, agriculture is very competitive <laughs> and, the, and the market is quite volatile. So t to continue farming, producers always have to be looking at new opportunities, looking for ways that they can continue to diversify. And I think one thing that we're also seeing with the rising age of farmers, mm -hmm. when they think about bringing their son or daughter back onto the farm, they have to look at maybe starting a new enterprise that can support another family. So that also is an important aspect as well. It all blends together, doesn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, something else that, that's working with that whole process is the best management practices. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the be best management practices on our show, and there's a grant created around BMPs. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Virginia Tech and Virginia Cooperative Extension were fortunate to receive a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and their Chesapeake Bay Stewardship Fund. And we're trying to continue to raise awareness of farm to table opportunities. At the same time, we're working with farmers on soil and water conservation practices, encouraging uh, more soil health building practices, such mm -hmm. as cover crops, crop rotations, trying to minimize tillage where, where possible. And specifically here in the valley, we've seen a tremendous growth in commercial vegetable production and so we're trying to reduce the amount of tillage that might go into those operations so again trying to keep the soil covered and being aware of their soil and water resources and particularly local as well as regional waterways. Now the BMP grant is that limited to large farms? Does it have to be a specific size of farm to be eligible for that? For, for our specific grant, we have really focused on those that are, are doing more direct to consumer sales, but then we've also trying to focus in on what we define as sort of small and mid-sized farms. Here in, in Virginia, that accounts for about 4,900 to 5,000 farms. But any farmer that's 
trying to do both direct to consumer, direct to restaurants or grocery stores, and trying to get into those intermediated markets, we're glad to work with them. And what we're trying to do is really create a win-win-win situation, a, you know, a win for the farmer, hopefully with opening up some new markets, right? consumer that knows where the food is coming from, and then the restaurant or grocery store can also say that we're working with farmers that are really good stewards of the natural resources that they manage. Absolutely. So it could be a win-win-win situation. Well, you know, the, the, other, the other trend that's growing seems to be the organic trend. Mm -hmm. So can these best management practices help with that organic certification and, and growing the organic produce that people are demanding? Absolutely. As, as part, of, a part of this grant, we have also worked with a number of producers in, in their mind when they heard the word no-till, they automatically associated that with herbicides or pesticides. But right. now there's different ways of managing uh, the growing of crops that it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to use herbicides or pesticides, that there's uh, in this case, we actually used a roller crimper to, to kill the cover crop. So there's more and more options for growers of all types and methodologies. It amazes me, um, in the few years that, that I've been doing this show, talking to people, how many breakthroughs just keep happening? I mean, the guys at Virginia Tech, there's constantly something going on. They're, they're testing things in the soil, they're testing different crops, they're finding ways to help farmers do their job better and easier. And it, it just, it amazes me the things that they have going on. Well, I think we're, we've been fortunate to also partner with some very innovative farmers. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think with, with the grant opportunities, it's always, how do you cooperate? How do you build collaboration and coalition with the issue of trying to clean up the Chesapeake Bay, it's going to take everyone to be involved. And that's one thing that we're also trying to emphasize that consumers and the non-farming public also need to do their part to protect soil Absolutely. and water resources as well. Because uh, you know, we have beautiful farmland and in the Chesapeake Bay is a beautiful, important natural resource. Absolutely. Can you give us some examples of what some farmers have been successful with using the best management practices? Uh, well, we, what we have done is with our specific is actually go onto the farm, see what type of practices, you know, conservation practices that they have already implemented and then try to gauge where there's opportunity for continuous improvement. And when um, you say we, let me stop you there. Who is we? Uh, my colleagues, both with Virginia Cooperative Extension. We've also worked with uh, Dale Gardner's, another collaborator. And we also have partnered with the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, okay. as well as the uh, local soil and water conservation district. And just to understand you know, how are the farmers managing the nutrients that they have, you know, particularly with uh, whether it's dairy or poultry, but we've specifically focused on commercial vegetable production in a lot okay. of cases. So making sure you have a nutrient management plan, uh, being understanding when you have a rain event on your farm, where the water <laughs> where is it's actually going. flowing to, right. and then the importance of doing all that you can to keep the soil and the water from running off. Because, you know, as we know now, water is a critical resource for plant production, crop production. So trying to keep the water so it actually infiltrates the ground. So that's one reason why we're encouraging the cover cropping, the no-till, and uh, other practices that can build soil health. Well. I think one reason that, that this program has been so successful is just exactly what you said. It's not, it's not one department 
trying to do all this. You have help from so many different mm -hmm. agencies, mm -hmm. and I think that's why that's why Virginia has really stepped ahead in so many cases in the in the Chesapeake Bay watershed in that cleanup effort. Yes, as as I said, it's, it's everybody needs to be involved to really right. solve the problem. It's you know, can't be just on the farmers, but it's also part of our culture and society. The the general public to protect the resources that we have. And so we're, we've are we been fortunate to be able to partner with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation as well as, well as other agencies and organizations. But as I mentioned, you know, having collaborating farmers, that's really critical. And through the funding that we've received that you can work at innovation experiment with different strategies for addressing the issue right you know talk with farmers you know what they see as issues and maybe some obstacles that they're facing and then by working together you can actually hopefully overcome the issues and improve water quality and the quality of life for everyone in Virginia and the Chesapeake Bay watershed so your BMPs have your farmer working at at the best they can be working for them and for the land. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a resource available for a farmer who wants to sell to a restaurant, a school, or an institution? And on the reverse, if a restaurant, a school, or an institution is looking for local food, mm -hmm. where do they go? Is there is there a go-between person for that? Well, there'd be several uh, resources. Virginia Cooperative Extension actually coordinates the Shenandoah Valley Bifresh by local chapter. So if the people would want to uh, call our office, that would be one resource. Uh, here in Virginia, we also have the Virginia Grown Program. Right. That would be another, and that's coordinated by the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Okay. And then Virginia Tech and Virginia Cooperative Extension is also piloting a market maker program in collaboration with the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So that's wow. another resource. Again, trying to make better linkages and better connections right. from the farm to the table. Well, you guys are working hard, but you're doing really good work. And I know as a consumer, I appreciate that. Well, thank you. And we <laughs> thank everybody who supports Virginia agriculture and we look forward to uh, continuing to work and providing uh, opportunities from the farm to the table. Thank you for meeting us out here today, Eric. We really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be right back. Well, our pearl of wisdom this week is from it's from one of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, who once said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Submit your own Pearl of Wisdom through our website at virginiafarming.com. Oh, and one quick reminder, this television program is available 24-7 anywhere you have internet access. Many of our viewers say that they now watch the show on demand on their smartphones, and they're doing that while in the dairy barn, out in the field, maybe on a lunch break in the greenhouse, you name it. Just go to virginiafarming.com where we have more than 100 back episodes available anytime you like it, anywhere you like it. That does it for our show this week. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Jeff Ishy for Virginia Farming.
Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security. Would you like to put your business in front of rural America and the ag community every week? We have sponsorship opportunities available that will do just that. Contact us to find out how you can, you can milk it for all it's worth. 